Lord gave me a word, and we've heard, we've heard this word already today, having the right attitude. That is so important for us to have the right attitude wherever, especially where God is concerned. In 1 Thessalonians 5 it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We are not to thank God for all the negatives that we experience. I've heard people say that, but it's not true. We are not to thank God for the negatives. We're going to thank him in them. While we're going through them, we're going to be thankful to him. We're going to be rejoicing always. No matter what's happening. Do you know the best time to rejoice is when all hell's breaking loose around you. It frightens the devil. It scares him so he runs off. He does not like people rejoicing because it makes the joy rise up. When you rejoice, your joy rises up. And when your joy rises up, your fear of the devil and everything that he can do falls down. You've got no, he's got no power over you when you can rejoice. It is wonderful to rejoice when God is doing things and you're, you're, you know he's going to bring you through it. It says pray constantly, pray without ceasing about the big things and about the little things. All too often we've, we've heard of people who, who've decided what they're going to do, made their plan and said, God will you please bless this plan. And God doesn't have a process like that. God says you come to me and I'll give you a pre-blessed plan. A plan that will work. Don't make a decision and then ask God to bless it. Because that's you decided that. Go to him and say, what shall I do in this situation? Lord, how do you want me to handle it? And I don't know about you, but more than often than not, he will give us a scripture. And we'll look at this scripture and it will apply exactly to what we're thinking about. We say, thank you, Lord. Now we know it's going to work. And give thanks in everything. If you fall over and trip and hurt yourself, give thanks. What, because you fell over and hurt yourself? No, because he's going to heal you. If a big bill comes through the door you weren't expecting and you haven't got the money to pay that bill, give thanks, thank you, Jesus, because he's going to pay it. He, he's going to pay it. I still can't better Jesse Duplantis' version of what happens. When a bill comes through uh, to them, who is ministry, he, he looks at it and goes, Jesus, you got mail. Because Jesus said he would supply all our need, did he not? And so we can be thankful, we can rejoice and we can be glad whenever the things that are negative are going on because we know he's going to get us out of them. If you look back at any areas of problems that you've had in the past, I use the word had, because they're not there now, are they? You might still have some issues, but you've had some things that have been and gone. And the Bible says... He's going to bring us through. We're not going to camp in the negative area. He's going to go, we're going to go through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I like what you said earlier on, Paul. It's lovely, that. It's shadows. As somebody once said, the shadow of a dog never bit anybody. <laughs> and the shadow of a devil can't harm you either. It's a shadow. It's not real. It just looks scary, but it's not. And if you're used to going, wow, that is scary, thank you, Jesus. You know, and you're thanking God, the scary just goes. Because he's looking after you, amen? And all the things that you had, you've come through them. At the time you thought, I'm never going to get out, I can't see how we're going to get out of this. I cannot see an answer to this. And then God brings something along, and there you are. Let's have a look and see how Paul... Uh, not you, Paul. The other one, the one, the one in the Bible handled all this. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now when I looked at that, I thought, um, there's a Paul not understanding here, he's actually a prisoner of the Romans. 
He's a prisoner of the Romans in a Roman jail. I'm thinking, you're not, you're not getting this, Paul, are you? You're actually a prisoner here, and the Romans have put you in jail. But as far as he's concerned, God put him in there. Because if I'm in jail, and the Romans think they put me in jail, I'm going to declare it's God that did this, because he's going to get the glory out of this somehow. He wrote quite a few of the, the letters, the epistles that we read, from jail. Do you not realise that? Quite a few of the ones he wrote, he wrote, he wrote from jail. Now if that's not being used by God, I don't know what is. So as far as he's concerned, he's the prisoner of God. The reason he's in jail is because God wants him there. God has got a purpose for him. Do you remember anybody else in the Old Testament that was a bit like that? Joseph. Joseph. Yeah. He ended up in jail. Why was he in jail? To save some people's lives. And then eventually to save the nation of Egypt. But if he hadn't been put in jail through a trumped-up charge, if he hadn't been put in jail, that wouldn't have been possible. So maybe Joseph thought, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I am here because God's got something to do. And then, you know, we've got some things that happen in our lives and we don't think, well, God put me in jail. No, God's going to do good out of me being in this negative situation. Don't know how it's going to work, but he will. See, his present state, being a prisoner of the Lord, blesses God. It doesn't, it lifts God up, it doesn't lift Paul up, but, you know, he doesn't mind that. He had the right mental attitude to help him through it. He was not thinking, God, I'm in jail here because of these Romans. I wish they hadn't done it. So would somebody get rid of the Romans? No, no. I'm a prisoner of the Lord, so whatever's going on in here, God's going to get the glory for it. And we know that when negative things go, he can get that too. And then he says, I beseech you. I am begging you. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Really, he's firstly saying, I want you to have the same attitude as me. When things are going bad, get your rejoicing out. Get your thankfulness out. Get your praying out. Get it going and then the devil will leave you and God will get you through. We want to walk worthy, he says, of our calling. What is our calling? Well, your first calling was God's invitation to you to come to Jesus and get saved. Did you accept that invitation? Yeah? Well, that was your first call, your first calling. What are your other callings? I don't know. God, God knows what they are. And it's what he's called you from that you can put aside now, you can get rid of now, and what he's called you to that you can reach towards. So we have to remember what we've been called from, what we've been called to. I was called from being an atheist and a heathen from hell. And I'm called to being a child of God and a preacher of the gospel. So I'm not doing that anymore and I'm doing this instead. And that's what our attitude should be. He's called every one of us. He has got a purpose for every one of our lives, a specific purpose. If you don't know what yours is, you might by the end of this message. You never know. You never know. In the next verse, Paul says, you need to do this with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. How do we walk worthy? We walk worthy by being in love, by walking in love, by doing things based on love. Having a lowly attitude means I am down, lifting them up. Some people don't like the word submission until you realise what the word submission means. Sub means under, and mission means somebody's doing something. So if you're in submission to somebody, you're under them, lifting them up and supporting them to do their ministry, to do their mission. Submission. And when it, when it comes to submission, you're always supporting somebody else's mission. Lifting them up and empowering them and blessing them. Being gentle. Now I can struggle with this sometimes. Because I wasn't taught to be gentle in my home. I certainly wasn't taught it in the army. They don't do gentle. Uh, but, you know, 
you have to be gentle because you might think you're a very, very fragile person yourself but there will be people who are more fragile than you you might find, think you're strong and effective but there are people around you who aren't and so they have to be treated gently and while we're doing this we have to accept that there's going to be some suffering involved we don't want to suffer do we? the suffering means you're going to have to go through some stuff you really don't want to go through to bless somebody else you might have to hold your tongue that might be a suffering from you because you might like to talk all the time you might like to tell everybody what you think all the time and give them all what your opinion is and your suffering might be for that moment shh, don't say anything and you're going, yeah but God I've got so many things I want to tell them about and he's saying, no, you be quiet, I'll sort them out and that's be hard for some people that's suffering, sometimes suffering is having to go and do something for a person you're not that keen on actually do something for them encourage them, bless them, empower them some way well we do that, we enjoy doing that when we're called to do it God calls us, we'll go and do it happy to do that accepting we might have to suffer a while to keep the unity we need to have some unity bearing with one another means being more tolerant some people can't spell tolerant I don't mean that your English is very good, it's a word you just don't use you don't use tolerant, you don't use peaceful and calm and gentle but bearing with one another means being, being tolerant remembering the other person has got you to deal with if you think they're a problem to you imagine what you're like to them that allows you to be a bit more tolerant because some people struggle with relationship with people and we just have to remember what the other person's like and how they're going to have to put up with us Amen? and do it all without complaining do it all without complaining, instead giving thanks for all of it now sometimes God will bring a person along into your life that is a, a struggle somebody you can't really handle, you have a real problem with and do you know why he'll bring, them, bring that person along? because he knows you can do it he knows you can do it and you will go through this with flying colours and be a blessing to that person and a blessing to God he knows you can do it because you give thanks every time something negative happens Amen? Give thanks in Jesus name In verse 3 it says Endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace Endeavouring That means it might take a lot of effort on your part to do this Well so, what else have you got to do? What else have you got to do? We're going to live forever so this little tiny portion of time here while we're on this earth we might as well put a bit of effort into it, wouldn't you agree? let's put a bit of effort into doing this right being gentle and tolerant and, and mild with people they will enjoy it too you see it's the unity of the spirit not of the flesh we are never going to be in unity in the flesh we can't do it we're all too diverse and different it won't happen at all so our natural flesh part, our soulish part, might find this bit difficult so you'll get your soul to be quiet and your spirit will tell your soul what to do let your spirit, you the spirit, the one that's connected with God let your spirit tell your soul and your body what to do when you get up in the morning and God says I want you to go and do this to your spirit and your body says do, I'm not even going to get out of bed this morning well your spirit will tell your body get up if you let it to do it, let it do it because your spirit is joined to the spirit of God let that spirit take charge don't be in charge of your life, let him do it let him lead you and guide you he says let the unity of the spirit be there in the bond of peace 
this word bond is exactly the same word as the ligaments in the human body. We all know that we are members of the body of Christ, would you agree? Well, members of a body, like this part of my arm and that part of my arm, are connected together with a joint and ligaments, a bond. That bond keeps the bottom half of my arm from falling off and connecting to the top. So my arm bone is connected to my shoulder bone and it's held there by ligaments, keeping all the muscles and everything together. And we keep our relationships between one another in this bond of peace. The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He wants to hold us all together to bring peace amongst us because of the things that are going on in our lives that might not be very nice. And if you see somebody that's going through some stuff, you can be there for them. You can be comforting and encouraging and blessing to them. See, the thing is, while we're doing all this, it says in verse 4, for there is one body, one spirit, just that you were, whole, you were called in one hope of your calling. There's just one body, the body of Christ, the church, the Christians. There's only one Holy Spirit that ministers to us all and through us all. There's only one hope and his name is Jesus. There's only one hope. When people say they are hopeless, what they usually mean is, I don't know Jesus. A person who has Jesus has got hope. You've got hope because the Bible says he will bring you through and you can do this stuff. You don't have to worry and, and fret about things. Go to him and get his strength. Amen? You know, many of us came here today uh, in, in a vehicle, in a motor vehicle, propelled by a, 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 some kind of engine, a, a petrol or diesel engine, that had to have fuel. Well, Jesus will put fuel into your life so you can go do stuff you don't have to do on your own. You don't have to do things on your own. You don't have to walk anywhere, everywhere because you've got a car. You don't have to do stuff in your own strength anymore because you've got Jesus who will bring that strength to you. Amen? And we know that this Holy Spirit will do these things for us. But that means if there's only one body and only one spirit and only one hope, if you see somebody ministering and blessing in a way that you think, oh, that's really good, I wish I could do that, then do it. If God can bless and empower that person, he can bless and empower you. If you believe that there's something you want to do for God, do it. What if I get it wrong? You're getting it wrong now by not doing it. What if I make a mistake? It's okay, God can handle mistakes. It's easier for him to, to handle a mistake that somebody's made than it is for trying to get somebody to do it in the first place. There are far too many of us don't want to do anything in case we get something wrong. Yeah? I've been there, I've done that. Not only, I can't be bothered anymore. If I get it wrong, I get it wrong. We prayed when we first started this church, Lord, we are going to make mistakes. Was that a bad statement? No, it was just the truth. We are going to make mistakes. So we pray right now, Lord, that when we do make mistakes, we pray that nobody gets hurt. You put it right. You sort it out for us. And nobody will get hurt. And we believe that. You know? So if you believe that there's something that somebody's doing and you'd like to be able to do it, get on and do it. You've got God's power and God's strength and his word behind you. If you can prosper that person to do it, he can prosper you to do it because there's only one God, there's only one spirit and there's only one hope. And if they can do it with those three things, so can you. Amen? Amen? I like that. And if you see somebody doing something that you don't like, don't copy them. If you see somebody doing something, you see it harming them, don't copy them. Instead, pray for them. If you see people that are staying away from church and staying away from fellowship, then pray for them. Often, it doesn't work to talk to them, as we found out over the years. Often, going to talk to them and say, so why aren't you in church anymore? Because you're going to hear some negative stuff probably. It's best not to hear it. Just pray for them. 
and ask God to minister to them and say to him but if you want me to go and talk to them I'll go and do it but in the meantime I'm going to leave it in your hands you, you decide Lord you decide then tells us in Ephesians 4 5 there's one Lord one faith one baptism one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all I've got a few minutes I can finish this off with but I could probably preach about this subject for the next several years just those two verses there is so much in there there is one Lord only one now in this country oh we still got a few people that are called Lord because that's their title as a person uh, but there's only one Lord and there's only one faith I don't know what all the other ones are doing but they haven't got faith if the Bible says there's only one faith and the faith is in Jesus if you got faith in somebody else it's a fake faith it's not really faith at all and there's one baptism what do you mean one baptism I was baptized in the Holy Ghost I was baptized in water no, this is the other baptism. Baptized into Christ. When you first get saved, when you first get born again, another phrase that describes that is being baptized into Christ. In other words, you're in him and he's in you. And the word baptism means to be totally submerged and everything that's in that liquid that you're in is now part of you. So you're baptised into Christ, so Christ is now in you. And you have his strength, you have his empowering in you. And also the word baptism, is a, they used to use this word years ago. I think I saw a recipe some, that was written in about 300 AD about how to, how to make pickles. Yeah? And it was a a Greek person that I was doing this recipe and he says what you do is you baptize the pickles in the vinegar what does that mean you don't just put it it's not like it's not like getting the onions say uh, and, and washing them that's putting them in fluid in liquid and washing them when you baptize them in the vinegar does anybody like pickled onions by the way I, I brought a, a jar one time to talk about when that's been in there for almost no time at all hardly any time at all it's not the same and it can never ever ever go back to the way it was you can you can take a pickle out of a jar of pickles and you can wash it till the cows come home it will still be a pickle you are baptized into Christ and Christ is in you and you can do the most negative things and the most horrible things you like Christ is still in you and he's there to get you out of the problems he's there to get you out of your struggles he's there to get you back on track when you're wandering off you are baptised into Christ Amen. one baptism that really counts yes you can be baptised in the spirit and pray in tongues that's wonderful you can be baptised in water yeah that's brilliant too but being baptised into Christ is the most important thing that ever happens to any person on this planet. Amen. Hallelujah. When you're baptised into Christ, you're born again. Born again Christian. There's no other kind. You can't be a Christian and not be born again. You might you might be some of these religious people that we've met that don't use the phrase born again because it's a bit too bit too out there for them but if you look at, look at their lives and listen to their words and their heart you find they're actually born again they're just not using the phrase but a person who's not born again isn't a Christian I don't care what anybody else says that's my take on that there's just one God and his name's not Allah or Muhammad, or Buddha, or Harry. It's none of them. There's one God, and his name is Jehovah, and his son is Jesus Christ. 
That's why it's often good to say uh, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because uh, quite a few of the, um, I've done some studies on it, quite a few of the Anglican statements of faith say God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, linking the two together. So if it isn't God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not God. There's one God. If the Bible says there's one God, anybody else they call God isn't. It's probably a demon. There's millions of people in this world are worshipping demons. They don't know they're demons because somebody once called it a God. Well, it's not. There's one. And he's the father of all. You mean he's the father of all the heathen as well? He can be if they choose him. He's ready to be if they choose him. But he's the father of every single person who's chosen Jesus. He's the father. He is the father. He's the daddy. He's the best example of a father there ever was. You can't get a better example. And some of us didn't have such a brilliant example of being fathered when we were young. Well, this one's brilliant. And he can put right all the negatives and all the fears and all the doubts and all the harsh speaking that was spoken against you when you were young. He can fix all that. But he's, because he's the one God, he's the Father. Hallelujah. And some people tell me, well, I find it difficult to reach God. I don't seem to be able to connect with him and get in fellowship with him. Well, you're probably trying in the wrong way. Let me show you how this works. He is above all. He is above you. That means he is your protection, your covering, your blessing, your peace. He's above you. Which also means you're beneath him. Yeah, which means you have got to look up to God. When we praise, we don't, we don't put our hands down to the ground, do we? We don't put them out sideways. We put them up because that's where our expectation of heaven is. It's up. Yeah? So when we're looking at that, he is above all. He's above you, he's above every negative situation in this world, he's above every heathen, he's above every so-called God, he's above everything in this world. He's above all. So if you want to find God, look up. And he's through all. How is he through all? Everything that ever happens in this world that's done by God is done through a person. If it isn't you laying hands on for somebody, it's sometimes it's invisible, you can't see it at all. You prayed for somebody and somebody got healed. Nobody saw a thing, but it came through you. The power came through you. We prayed for people this morning and the power came through to you. Everything that you do that blesses people is because of the power from God that comes through you to them. It's not you. You don't need to have any power. This is the key about being a Christian to me. I don't need to have any power. He's got it all. And the Bible even says if I get myself into a situation where I don't know what to say, don't worry, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Which none of your enemies can gainsay. In other words, they can't argue against it and they can't resist it either. And this is why there's so many negative things going on in this world at the moment and negative ways of thinking and looking and acting and talking because they're trying to push people away from Christianity. They're trying to say whether, whether, whether you're a male or a female or this sort of rubbish is more important than your Christian life. Well, it's not. But they're trying to put it up there. The agenda's really high. I don't care. What we're saying is true. There's one God, one faith one Lord, one baptism, and we are the ones that are declaring it. Amen? Do you know there's nobody else on this planet except the body of Christ, except you and me and people like us that are declaring Jesus? Nobody else. Nobody else is declaring Jesus. We have got a job to do here. We have got a job to do. And he ministers to other people through you, and he is in you all. If you want to know where God is, he's in you. 
He is in you. He's not beside you, although he is beside you. He's above you. He's through you. But most of all, he is in you. He's in your life. He's in your mind. He's in your body. He's in your spirit. And you know that he's there. Amen? He's in you, making you the channel of his power. He's in you as the ultimate dad. As his child, with him being in you, and above you, and through you, you cannot fail. You cannot fail. If it looks like failure, rejoice! Thank you, Lord, this looks like failure. How are you getting me out of this, Lord? And as long as your attitude is always, I'm coming through this. I'm coming through this. I'm not camping here where it's negative. This is just a glitch. You know, I mean, if you, have you ever been in a situation where your car broke down? Most of us have at some time. Do you say, that's it, I've had it with cars, I'm not having it anymore. Or do you get it fixed? You get it fixed. If something goes wrong with your life, and things start going negative, you don't go, that's it, I've had enough with life. You don't. You get it fixed. You go to Jesus, you ask him to help you. You go to your friends and ask them to help you. But you try and get it fixed. Because you can't fail if you're looking to God, the one that's above you and through you and in you. And remember that he's your dad. I don't know if you've ever, if you called him dad, I don't know if you do. I, I'm not going to ask you personally. But I do remember there was a long time when I, after I became a Christian, he was always father. And even then, it was still a, quite a strange word because I was talking about love where he was concerned and we never used that phrase in our, ham our family. Nobody ever told anybody they loved them. And it was very strange when I found out that other people did. When I heard people saying, oh, I love you, bye, you know, I was thinking, ooh, I never heard that kind of thing before. And then one day when I was being prayed for, God spoke to me and, and called me his son and for the first time in my life I said these words, I love you dad. And if you've never said, you've never said I love you dad to God Almighty, let me encourage you to do that. Because he loves you. You are so awesome. You are so special. There's nobody like you. That's why God has such a hard job sorting us all out because we're all different. You know, he has, to, he has to work in completely different ways with every one of us. There's no blanket way of doing anything with God because we're all unique and different. But there is one thing that is clarified with these words here. There is one God. There is one faith in Jesus Christ. There is one hope and that's called Jesus. And if we can keep those in our minds, we cannot fail in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat>